thank you, Andre, and um, thank you very much, Lorenzo and Marco, and and to the University of Genoa, and the other organizer. It's a it's it's a huge pleasure to be here today to to speak with you, and it was a great pleasure to be invited to to join the the EU LOS uh, Summer School, um, which is a wonderful initiative. Um, and we're speaking on my favorite topic, which is which is BBNJ. Um, so as uh, as um, uh, Andre has said, um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer with the Irish Foreign Ministry. I work on law of the sea issues as, as, well, as, other, um, as, as well as other areas of international and, and domestic and, and EU law. Um, I was Ireland's head of delegation on BBNJ from, uh, in fact, not just for the five plus sessions of the IGC, but for the, um, the, the four sessions of the, the preparatory committee, the PREPCOM that, that preceded it. So, I've been following this process for seven years, which is uh, long enough. <laughs> so I was as relieved as anyone else when we finally managed to reach agreement in the, uh, earlier this year. Um, I was uh, a member of the, the EU negotiating team uh, in the negotiations. Those of you who are familiar with, with EU law will realize, uh, you will understand the joys of competence and what are issues of national competence, shared competence, exclusive union competence, and um, the BBNJ agreement covers all three, <laughs> although it is largely uh, concerns the, the, the marine environments, which would be an issue of, 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 of shared competence. Uh, so the EU has negotiating as a single block in the process, and we had a team, uh, a negotiating team comprising uh, representatives of member states as well as the European Commission and I was the co-lead on uh, capacity building in the transfer of, uh, of marine technology uh, which I should add was the part of the agreement which was uh, concluded first um, as any of you were there will know we were due to finish the negotiations last March on a Friday afternoon at 6 p.m. Uh, they went right through the night um, uh, and all the way up until about 9 p.m. on the Saturday night before the, um, before the agreement was concluded and everyone was walking around like zombies. Um, uh, but uh, the capacity building chapter was concluded, I think it was on the Thursday afternoon, which I like to think is a reflection of the quality of the negotiators. Uh, but uh, I think maybe we just had fewer complex and <laughs> difficult issues to deal with. Um, uh, I should just say, like any good lawyer, uh, I should make a disclaimer. Um, I do want to try and be as interesting and candid as possible, so I am, strictly speaking, um, here in my, my personal capacity, and so any, if anything I say doesn't necessarily reflect the view of the, the Irish government or, the, or, or indeed the European Union. Um, so just uh, getting into, getting into it, um, uh, Capacity building and the transfer of marine technology or the transfer of technology generally is a, is a feature of, of many international agreements, which many of you will, will have come across. Um, uh, if you look at the, the, the and, in, and increasingly there's a, there's a bigger component of this to, to, to agreements, particularly multilateral uh, environmental agreements. Uh, and you've seen, particularly with the, the Paris Agreement, there's a very um, significant capacity building and, and funding uh, regime attached to that with uh, green climate finance, etc. Um, uh, UNCLOS uh, did contain a dedicated part, part 14, on, the, on development and transfer of marine technology. Um, it's, it's quite general. Um, it does not provide for any hard mechanisms uh, or institutional machinery to facilitate capacity building or, or technology transfer. And uh, certainly the sentiments that we were hearing in the BBNJ negotiations from developing countries was that they were somewhat disillusioned with, uh, with, uh, with the, the failure as they saw it of uh, part 14 of UNCLOS to, to be realized. Um, and uh, so in, in, in this agreement, we did try to go further and, and, and be a little bit more substantial in terms of the, the capacity building and technology transfer offering. Um, uh, so UNCLOS Part 14 was very much a reference point because, of course, this is an UNCLOS implementing agreement um, and we had to be faithful to the convention 
um, and guided by it. And another important point of reference for these negotiations uh, were the, um, uh, the, the, the IOC um, criterion guidelines on the transfer of marine technology. Um, the IOC is the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of, of UNESCO, uh, which was given the mandate uh, under Part 14 of UNCLOS to develop guidelines. Um, and they put a little bit of meat on the bone uh, of Part 14 and, and the sort of modalities for, uh, for, for the transfer of marine technology. And um, they were very, very influential in, in, in the text of, of what was agreed in, in BBNJ. Um, and um, they, they will no doubt have an important role to play in the, in, in the implementation. Um, capacity building and the transfer of marine technology are not defined in the agreements, despite there having been several proposals to do so. Um, it, there is a non-exhaustive definition of marine technology in Article 1, which draws heavily on the IOC uh, guidelines. That's a bit of an innovation. Uh, but certainly the view of many states, including the EU, was that um, we don't need to define capacity, build, capacity building in the transfer of marine technology. It's, 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 uh, these are terms that are understood in, in their own ordinary words. Um, and we also didn't want to um, confine ourselves to a definition which may not prove to be future-proofed. Um, so, I mean, we think they're easily understandable concepts, and they're essentially concerned with increasing the capacity of states, uh, in particular developing states, uh, to achieve the objectives of the agreement, um, including through um, enhancing their technological capacities. Um, so, as has already been touched on, um, BBNJ was a package, and this dates back to the days of the ad hoc working group, uh, which Andre referred to. This whole process has been going on for almost 20 years. Um, and um, so it, it, it comprised area-based management tools, environmental impact assessments, MGRs, and capacity building in the transfer of marine technology. And um, uh, the reason that uh, capacity building and technology transfer was considered such a crucial component uh, is that we knew that for this treaty, which is governing the global commons, it's, it's governing the areas beyond national jurisdiction, which belong to everyone and no one, in order for that to have legitimacy, uh, for, in order for this agreement to uh, enjoy wide ratification, um, we needed uh, developing countries to be able to m participate meaningfully in, in the agreement uh, and, and share, share some of the benefits that we've already heard about um, uh, this morning. Uh, and it, it's quite clear that many, many countries uh, lack the capacity at present in relation to the more substantive aspects of the agreement. So, you know, we're talking about, for instance, the capacity to conduct EIAs, which uh, Jessica has already touched on. Um, the, we're talking about the capacity to monitor and ensure respect for, um, for marine protected areas. Uh, you know, a, a state would have a responsibility to monitor its flag vessels, you know, uh, vessels flying its flags and making sure that they're complying with management measures in place within a marine protected area. And, and many, many states will lack the capacity to do that. Um, we're talking about things like the capacity to sample, research, and utilize marine genetic resources, uh, which Iris has touched on. Uh, so uh, that's, that, that was why there was such a sense of uh, why this was, uh, was a crucial component of the BBNJ package. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the, the uh, capacity building and technology transfer scheme within the agreement. Uh, this is mainly in, in part five, um, although um, there, are, um, there are also aspects which are very relevant to, uh, to capacity building and technology transfer, which are found outside of part five, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain those in more detail. So we're going to look at the objectives um, of capacity building and tech transfer the cooperation obligation that applies to states' parties, uh, 
the modalities for achieving it, the types, and I've already touched on a few of them, of, of, of capacity building and tech transfer, um, the monitoring review mechanism that's set out in the, in the, in the agreement, um, the specialized committee uh, to oversee um, capacity, ability, uh, capacity building and technology transfer activities, um, uh, and I'll also touch on the, the clearinghouse mechanism, uh, which we've already heard a little bit about, and crucially, funding. Okay, so very briefly, um, Article 40 of the agreement sets out at a very high level the, um, the, uh, the objectives uh, of capacity building and, and technology transfer. And these are to assist states parties, in particular developing states parties, in implementing the agreement to achieve its objectives. And also to develop relevant marine scientific and technological capacity of parties, in particular developing states parties. So Article 41 uh, sets out the general cooperation obligation, and in a sense this reflects some of the language of UNCLOS uh, Part 14, um, uh, but it, 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 it is different in some sense, and um, the, the general obligation which is uh, set out in this provision and is further elaborated in Article 42 uh, was a big focus of the negotiations. Um, the um, question of whether capacity building and technology transfer should be mandatory or voluntary was a somewhat binary debate that uh, plagued the negotiations for many, many years. Um, and uh, for, for, for many, many years, we had two options in this, in this paragraph of Article 41. Uh, one said that parties um, uh, uh, shall ensure capacity building, etc., and then bracketed next to it was shall promote capacity building, etc. And this was very much a global north versus global south uh, debate. Um, uh, and um, it was this. This ended up being a very difficult clause to negotiate. Um, uh, as we'll see further on, this. Did we end up with something obligatory or voluntary? The question, is, the, the answer is that we ended up with a bit of both. It was a bit of a compromise. But how we define the obligation, we ended up with a landing zone which was, I am happy to say, proposed by the EU and its member states, uh, which instead of saying shall ensure or uh, shall promote, we ended up saying parties shall cooperate in achieving the uh, agreement's objectives through capacity building and technology transfer. And it's envisaged that this uh, cooperation can take place through existing institutions. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to focus on added value. So we should be using existing bodies, multilateral, regional, sub-regional bodies as much as possible, um, as well as through bilateral cooperations uh, such as ODA, et cetera. Um, uh, there's, there's a requirement for states parties to give full recognition to the special requirements of developing states parties, and that's elaborated to include SIDS, African coastal states, etc. Um, it envisages a, a cooperative role for the private sector, as well as other actors such as civil society, indigenous peoples, and local communities as holders of traditional knowledge. So it's, 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 it envisages a sort of cooperative pr participatory uh, model. Articles uh, 42 and 43 um, set out the, the modalities. Um, so Article 42 further elaborates the general obligation with respect to capacity building and technology transfer. Um, this was extremely uh, difficult to negotiate. Um, uh, and what we ended up, in fact, was with differentiated obligations with respect to capacity building and in respect of the transfer from new technology. So you can see in the first bullet point, uh, it's, the, the, the text requires that parties within their capabilities shall ensure capacity building for developing states parties and shall cooperate to achieve the transfer of marine technology. Um, the 
controversy with um, technology transfer being mandatory is very real. And Andre spoke earlier about the delays uh, of uh, UNCLOS coming into force. UNCLOS was concluded in 1982, uh, and it only entered into force in 1994. And that was partly due to slow ratifications, but in fact, the main reason for the delay was that the United States uh, determined that it could not accept uh, part 11 of the convention, which pertained to the area and, uh, and, and the seabed mining regime. But one of the issues that was most problematic for the United States was that there was a mandatory technology transfer provision in that. Um, so um, the US started a campaign of um, demarching like-minded states around the world uh, to uh, withhold their ratification of UNCLOS until the 1994 implementing agreement was negotiated and it essentially renegotiated aspects of part 11 and that opened up the, the way for UNCLOS to, to receive the necessary number of ratifications to bring it into force. So we know from history that mandatory technology transfer is just a complete no-no for, for, for developed uh, countries. The problem is that there are um, intellectual property rights at stake. Um, there, there is a problem that um, states' parties are not, are very often not the holders of the technology. They're, they're, in, they're in private hands. Uh, so there's a limited ability to be able to inter interfere with that ownership. Um, so uh, that's why we ended up with this differentiated um, uh, obligation here. Um, so um, there's also an obligation on states' parties to provide within their capabilities resources to, com to support capacity building and technology transfer. And I'll speak a little bit more in, in, in detail. That's more of a headline provision, but th there are specific provisions on, on, on funding that, 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 we'll, that we'll come to. Um, and there's a provision providing that, you know, the, the, the whole regime needs to be based on the needs and priorities of develop, developing states. It's a needs-based needs approach, which, uh, which is enshrined in the, in, in, in the treaty. Um, this first bullet here, this provision um, is, uh, concerns the terms of uh, the transfer of marine technology. And this was extremely difficult to agree. Um, I think the, by far the most difficult provision to agree in this, in this part. Um, again, it comes back to what I discussed earlier. Developed uh, countries were pushing for a voluntary regime uh, and everything being based on mutually agreed terms, whereas uh, developing countries were pushing for a uh, mandatory, uh, a mandatory uh, regime uh, and favorable concessional preferential terms. The result is a bit of a word salad. Um, uh, it, it's inelegant uh, and perhaps an example of some constructive ambiguity that is often necessary uh, to find a landing zone in, in, in multilateral treaty making. Uh, I think Vasco referred earlier to some treaty provisions being abused children or something, something along those lines. Um, it reminds me of the, the quote from Bismarck who said that um, laws are like sausages. Uh, it's better not to see them being made. Um, and having been involved in negotiating this paragraph, I can say that is absolutely true. We went around in roundabouts. We went back and forth. By the end, we weren't even sure what we were reading. But um, we think we probably found a, a, reasonable, a reasonable landing zone. There is, however, requirements for parties to promote and encourage economic and legal conditions for the transfer of marine technology um, to developing states' parties. And this was, uh, inspiration was taken from a provision in the, in the, in the, in the TRIPS agreement uh, for this. And this sort of helped um, uh, assure uh, developing countries that that, that efforts could be taken um, to, to, to improve the terms on which technology is transferred. Uh, importantly, there is a repetition of unclass language uh, 
of the need to take into account rights over technologies and due regards for, for, for legitimate interests. Um, in terms of um, the types of capacity building and transforming technology, I've already outlined some of the, the, the possible types that, that can arise. Um, and in the agreement, it was decided not to try and exhaustively list every type of activity that could potentially take place. Instead, it was decided in Article 44, and then there's also a separate annex, Annex 2, to set out an indicative, non-exhaustive list of the, the types of activities that could take place under the, under the agreement. And it's things like the provision of technology and equipment, um, helping to develop relevant infrastructure, uh, sharing information, data, knowledge, education, training, scholarships, um, developing human resources, institutional capacity, regulatory frameworks, so things like helping, and this is something we're looking at at the moment, uh, helping countries to, to, to have the necessary legislation in place to help them become party to the agreements, the necessary environmental policies in place to be able to, uh, to participate in the agreement. Um, and um, it could also include assistance in the development, implementation, and enforcement of uh, national legislative, administrative, or policy measures. One of the uh, innovations of this agreement, in a way, was um, the institutional structures that are put in place uh, for capacity building technology transfer. In particular, the creation of a dedicated committee uh, with a monitoring and review role. Um, and so the, this committee will have a role in assessing and reviewing capacity building and technology transfer needs and priorities, uh, measuring performance, and there, there's an obligation for states parties to, to submit reports it will also have a role in identifying mobilizing funds under the financial mechanism. Uh, and then it reports back to the, the conference of parties, which is the ultimate decision-making body. So it will, it's sort of an advisory, an advisory role, but I imagine a very influential one on this, uh, on this topic. Um, it is, I mean, you, you do have similar entities in some agreements, but this probably goes further than most. We, we did take inspiration from the Port State Measures Agreement. In, in, in this, this idea of a committee was a, a joint EU and um, uh, CIDS, CIDS initiative. Uh, and CARICOM, I think, were involved as well. Um, we sort of built on the Port State Measures. They have a working group on, on capacity building. We sort of built on that. Um, so hopefully, it will become a model for, for other agreements in the, in, in the future. Also of relevance uh, in terms of the institutional machinery of the, of the agreement is the clearinghouse mechanism, which I know um, uh, Iris and, um, and Jessica have already touched on. Um, uh, but this, this will have a, have a very important capacity building uh, and technology transfer uh, function. It, it's going to consist primarily of an open access platform uh, to be managed by the secretariat. Uh, and there is, in the, in, the, in the agreement, the potential for functions to be performed by existing bodies, and it specifically name checks a few, uh, such as IOC, UNESCO, who already uh, do provide uh, some of these functions. And uh, I've been out to their facility in, in Ostend in Belgium and met with some of the people there. Um, uh, I, I do hope that we can build on the kind of work that they're doing. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very good facility, but it needs to be built on. I think they only have one member of staff working half of their time on, the, on, 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 this, uh, on this sort of clearinghouse type mechanism that they're, that they're responsible for. Um, so we would like to build on that. And um, the main role of the, the, the mechanism will be to be information sharing on, on ABMTs, on EIAs, on MGRs. Uh, but also on opportunities for capacity building and technology transfer. And uh, it is hoped that it, it can provide a sort of matchmaking facility that matches requests uh, from uh, would-be recipients, uh, 
of capacity building and technology transfer with potential donors. Finally, and crucially, funding. And uh, this was a this was a, a huge a huge issue in the in the negotiations. Um, uh, again, um, uh, developing countries were very keen to see a level of mandatory funding for capacity building, technology transfer, while the preference of uh, developed countries was for a voluntary model, which is the norm. Um, mandatory funding uh, for capacity building is very rare in international treaties. Um, uh, the only two other instances we could look to were in the World Heritage Convention and the Montreal Protocol. Um, and um, the, the issue with it is that it, it, it's often very, very difficult to sell for developed countries. We heard time and time again, um, you know, national parliaments simply will not agree to um, to, to, to sign what could potentially be a blank check, they, if something they can't quantify or, or get a sense of, of what they're signing up to, they simply will not be permitted to ratify it. There are even constitutional constraints in certain countries. Um, so we had to think very carefully about how we, how we, we overcame this difficulty. And uh, what we ended up doing, and this was a, a suggestion from the EU, was that we we, we link it, we link the mandatory contribution to the institutional budget of the, of, of the, of the BBNJ agreement. That way, there's, there's a ceiling to it, and, and, and we know that it's not going to exceed a certain, a certain threshold. It's, it's essentially capped. Um, so the, um, the Article 52 creates um, creates the, the financial mechanism for capacity building and tech transfer, and it comprises three funds. So first is a voluntary trust fund for participation in meetings of the kind we actually had during the BBNJ process for attending the diplomatic intergovernmental conference to negotiate it. We had a trust fund which facilitated the participation of many, many um, delegates from developing countries over the years. Um, it also establishes a global environment, GEF trust fund, uh, Jeff uh, works uh, to facilitate um, uh, the financial mechanism for a number of multilateral um, environmental uh, treaties. And it also creates a dedicated BBNJ special fund. And um, uh, this, is, this is financed firstly by the mandatory annual contributions. So this is the mandatory element that I was just talking about. Um, so under Article 14.6, we have what are known as upfront payments for MGRs. So in the MGR part, they could not agree a monetary benefit sharing system. And I think it's potentially because it's tied up with those ongoing negotiations in WIPO, which Iris talked about. Um, and it, it, they, just, they could not get that over the line. So, the, the Conference of Parties is empowered to come up with a monetary benefit sharing regime, but in the meantime, there will be upfront payments for MGRs, which will go into this capacity, capacity building fund. And only developed, country, only developed country states parties have to pay them, and they are set at 50% of the assessed contribution that that party has to make to essentially the institutional budget of the, of, of the BBNJ. Um, now, if you look at what that budget is likely to be, it's, it's, it's going to be modest enough. I mean, it's difficult to see if you're looking, if you're looking at you know, similar organizations, of, if you look at the ISA or bodies like that, it's difficult to see the institutional budget being more than 10 million, if even, or 20 million at the most. And so the capacity, the annual capacity building fund is only going to be half of that. So we're talking millions as opposed to the kinds of billions that we know are, are potentially needed when due to under various studies. So we know that, um, you know, this is only part of the picture and there's going to be a big reliance on, on voluntary contributions, uh, including from states, international bodies and the private sector. There's huge funding out there in the private sector if it, if, if it can be harnessed. 
Um, uh, uh, and then there's also the possibility that once an MGR monetary benefit sharing regime is operational, um, that could start producing significant funding, which, which could be channeled into, into capacity building and, 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 and technology uh, uh, transfer. So um, uh, this, is, um, this is something to be, that remains to be seen, but um, we think that the, the, the framework there is, is quite innovative. It's, it's, it's quite solid, and, and there's, a, there's, there's a good basis there for, um, for capacity building and technology transfer. But as Vasco has said, you know, more law or better law doesn't necessarily always bring the desired results, particularly in international law. And so much of this will ultimately come down to political will um, and the ability of, of states to, 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 you know, to ramp, ramp it up um, financing and ambition on, on the marine environment generally. So um, I can certainly say Ireland will be fully committed. I can't speak for everyone else. <laughs> uh, but um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And um, I'm happy to take any questions.